Welcome. Today we're going to talk about uh, approximations using orthogonal projections and inner products on function space. So that was a that's a long title, but let's just uh, let's get our bearings here, uh, and it'll make a lot more sense at the end. Let's say so. Remember the inner product. And it, the inner product was a special uh, function where we take two inputs, uh, u and v, and it spits out some real number. Okay, so uh, u and v in this case are going to be members of some vector space. And that's a fancy way of saying that uh, We, uh, or I should say, V is a set of vectors, and we we interpret vectors to be a very a, a very general idea, and they don't have to be uh, you know arrows or con, you know connected or any kind of you know sort of directed line segment and, and RN. It could be something like functions. But it's a set of these vectors, and I put quotes on that then. Uh, it's a set of vectors that um, contains all sums, u plus v, and weighted sums. So I can take uh, constants uh, c1 u plus c2 v, and it's also in uh, the vector space. Okay, so uh, it's this, it's a it's a set of vectors that is closed under addition. If any two vectors are in the vector space, then if I take the sum of those vectors or any weighted sum or a linear combination is uh, what it's otherwise called. That will also be in the vector space. So um, you can't add your way out of it. If that's one way to, to put it. Okay, so uh, we have this inner product, and the inner product has these nice properties. And we'll just write them down again symmetry. We don't care what order you put them in, and then linearity. And of course, this works really well with sums. If we're thinking about vector space, we want to sum two vectors together. We should have an inner product that works that way as well. So u, v plus w is going to be the sum of the inner products. I've got to put my arrows over things here to indicate that they're vectors. U comma w, like that. Okay, so there's symmetry and linearity, and uh, in addition to that, we also have that constants. Uh, and that's some sort of uh, real number, or it could be complex, I suppose. Uh, the, the, that constants uh, go right, pass right through the inner product as well. And then finally, the last one, inner product of a vector with itself is going to be positive, and this is called a positivity, is going to be z uh, greater than zero and equal to zero only if u itself is equal to zero. Okay, the zero vector, I should say. Okay, so those are the properties of, inner, of an inner product. Now we'd like to uh, switch gears a bit and talk and, and go back to what we talked about in the previous example of like this nice property of, uh, of orthogonal projection. So projection. So what we mean by projection, if I have W and I have some set, uh, VI, and it's an uh, orthogonal set, that spans 
our, our vector space V, then we want to be able to represent W as a linear combination of all our VIs. So C1, V1, plus C2, V2. And this goes from I to 1 to N, let's say, uh, plus C3, V3, dot, dot, all the way to CN, VN. Okay. And so we learned, uh, provided that uh, this set's orthogonal, and by that we mean that VI comma VJ is equal to zero when, when I is not equal to J. Okay? So all of these vectors here are mutually orthogonal. Then we have a nice formula we can to solve for all of the C's. And we call that CI is equal to VI W over the inner product of VI with itself. All right, what we call this right here is that orthogonal projection. And we think of that, it's an orthogonal projection, and we can put in parentheses, of W onto VI. That's what we mean by a projection of, and so this constant here then represents the amount of, 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 uh, of, of the vector VI that we need to go uh, to, to produce the appropriate component of W. Okay. So again, W is what we want to approximate, or W is what we want to actually equal. But the question then is, and this goes into the idea of approximation, so uh, what if our set does not span all of our vector space V. Well, then we can't guarantee, we, we can't always guarantee that we can find a linear combination of those vectors to add up to equal W for any W. Again, this is a given in problem. Okay, from i equals 1 to n. It's not necessarily true that we can always find coordinates that are going to be able to make these equal. But what if we just want to, so we want to get as close as possible. So what do we mean by close? I'll put that in quotes. Well, we have to have some sort of idea of the measurement of, of, of distance between W and, and any kind of uh, uh, linear combination of our, of our vectors VI. So of course, recall that the inner product uh, it induces or it, 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 it creates a, a measure of distance. So we know that if I have some vector, its length is equal to uh, the square root of the inner product of U with itself. And so we can think of this as a as a length. A length, of course, is a, a nice way to measure things. So it should be then that we want to do, so when I say length, uh, and we know that, um, and we also know that this is going to be zero only if u is equal to zero, right? And that's a, another property of the inner product. Okay, so let's uh, 
what we want to do then is, and what do we mean by close then, is we can actually take our, 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 our distance function and okay and do that we want to then minimize uh, th th this object here so our goal then is to minimize so what this represents here is the distance between W and our sum of VIs. And remember, these are unknowns. The idea is we want to choose, so our goal is to choose the CI, the CI constants that will minimize uh, so that the distance is small as possible. Okay, so this inner product now, it, 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 you can see it has a lot of things going for it that are really great. One, we have this notion of orthogonality and this notion of angle. Uh, and now we also get this notion of distance that's built into that angle. So we have a lot of nice tools we can use then to uh, start uh, doing some good work with this. So let's, let's do this problem again. Let's set this up. So I want to minimize... I want to minimize this object. Again, this is given in the problem. like such. So if I'm going to minimize this, I could also minimize the square of it because that just makes things um, as easy as possible to do. And that becomes, of course, this is our inner product. It's going to be W minus the sum CI VI comma W minus the sum C CI VI. All right? So uh, this becomes, and remember there's that property of linearity. The property of linearity says that the, 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 the inner product will pass through sums. So from this we see that this will become w, I, w minus the sum CI VI comma W plus the sum W minus the sum ci vi comma minus the sum ci vi and we can keep going with this and um, and uh, see that this will pass through these sums here we'll get w comma w uh, it should be should be also that these are the unknowns All right, so this is given in the problem, and our CIs are unknown. We want to choose these values that will minimize this distance between the two. All right, so that's our goal. And now we're doing the math to work out what this 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 thing is. All right, so uh, and that's by just uh, connecting those up, and we see that um, if we keep doing this, we're going to get a minus um, a minus. Two inner product sum C I V I comma uh, comma W and we're also going to get a plus sum C I V I comma sum C I V I okay. All right, so remember, these are, these are all sums here as well, right? So again, the inner product passes right through sums, so we should be able to keep whittling this down to figure it out here. And that becomes minus 2. 
And again, this inner product will pass right through this sum, and it'll pass right through any scalar multiplication. So we'll get a sum, i equals 1 to n, of ci times vi comma w. Okay, looks good. And now this. So recall, so this is a, a whole bunch of sums but on both sides. But recall that vi and vj, if, they are, if i and j are different, then it's equal to zero. All right, and the, and the scalar multiples, of course, they're going to multiply by each other, so we're going to end up with, and if you, if you work it out, if you do that, you can do this maybe on a sum of just uh, two terms in each one. You can figure out that this is what it's got to be. There's going to be a ci squared uh, vi comma vi. That's all you get. All the other terms all the other terms involving inner products of different vectors will be zero and we can discard them. So this is nice. All right, so this is the thing we want to minimize. We want to choose these CIs such that uh, this becomes as small as possible. So what we do to minimize things, of course, is, is take the partial derivative of it. So I'm going, to set, I'm going to make that not equal anymore. I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to C1. And I'll do C2, C3, C4. And then I want to set that equal to 0. And that's our standard uh, trick in calculus to, um, to minimize a function with respect to a variable. All right, so um, this term right here has no Cs in it, so it goes to 0. And this term only has uh, one term in it that's, that's i equals 1, so that becomes minus 2 v i w or sorry v one w likewise over here there's only one term with, with i equals one in it and it and it's squared so we're taking the derivative with respect to c one so we have squared so again we bring the two down two brings down c one times v one v one right we're going to set that equal to zero of course uh, the twos we they can cancel and then we're left, we solve for C1, which is going to be, uh, we have to subtract over, and we get V1 W over V1 inner product with itself. All right, so of course this again is the orthogonal projection. So what we're saying then is uh, w is approximately equal to the orthogonal projection, which is going to be uh, c1 v1. And notice then with this that we can do the same for c2, c3, all the way to Cn, right? It's the same, we'll get the same exact formula here for all of the Cis. So we can write down that W is going to be the best approximation is going to be exactly the orthogonal projection we had written down before, where each Ci is going to be of this form. We can actually make that now of I. So that works for any, any variable. Like so. So not only is this, does this work to find exact answers, if I want to find the best approximation to a vector, all I have to use, as long as I have an orthogonal set of, of vectors, I can come up with a best approximation. So that's really nice. We can use this over and over again in any context. So what I want to do now is do some examples of this. So um, what I want to talk about now, though, is um, an inner product space uh, 
of functions. So what we need to do then is we need to define uh, what the inner product is. Um, so we're going to consider this f and g as functions in this function space, which we'll call f. We need to define what we mean by the inner product of two functions. So what we're going to do is I'm going to do a, a like a you know just a really just get you an idea of why this works, and, and we go and and we'll write this down, and this will be the definition of the inner product, and it's going to be the integral. So uh, we have to. It'll be the integral. We have to define these functions on some interval that we're interested in. So we're going to say it's the functions that are continuous from some a to b some, on some interval. Maybe we'll make it an inclusive integral, interval there. All right. It'll be the integral from a to b of f of x times g of x dx. All right. So this, I contend, it works a lot like a dot product does for for vectors in Rn. Um, and to see why, of course, is that this is approximately some sort of, um, if this is some interval of A to B, and uh, if this is a Riemann integral, we can break up the, we can make an approximate approximation to this integral by making a bunch of Xi's, uh, just a bunch of uh, sample points of this interval. And say that that, and then we have each one of these sample points is delta x apart, and that becomes f of x i, g of x i, delta x, i equals one to n. All right, and so on those points we can actually define that to be what I'll call f i, and that to be g i, and then of course that becomes i equals one to n of f i, g i. A delta x. So this starts looking a little bit more like a, um, a, a, a dot product. It looks like a dot product because we can actually say that f then, we can think of a vector f as being f1, f2, all the way to fn, as being a vector in Rn which represents the function values just sampled at those points there. And the same thing for g. And so it, it's as if we've now taken our, our Rn and just taken n to infinity, right? And, uh, and then define them as functions on this interval a to b. Okay, so let's talk about some examples. Let's find orthogonal functions. So what do we, so now we, again, this gives us a notion of angle and orthogonality. So, so let's talk about some orthogonal functions. So I'm going to talk about this func function space on the interval. Uh, we'll just go from 0 to 2 pi. And I'm going to take two functions, sine of x and cosine of x. So here's our example. This is our example. So there's two functions. We want to know if they're orthogonal. So what I'm going to do is uh, actually uh, take the inner product of the two. So sine of x, cosine of x, right? So now they're in an, uh, in the, in, I put them both in our inner product, and we're going to take that function space from 0 to 2 pi, so that's my inner product, uh, so that'll be from 0 to 2 pi of uh, sine x times cosine of x, um, dx. All right, so uh, to d compute this integral, of course, we just pick u is equal to sine of x, and du is equal to, du dx is equal to cosine of x. So that means that du over cosine of x is equal to dx. So I can replace the dx here with this thing here, and we get and then what we do is we plug in 0 here, and we get 
zero, and we plug in two pi there, we also get zero. So all of a sudden we get a hint at what, what the answer is. And then we get u for sine, and then the cosines cancel between these two, we get a du left over. So this is the integral of u from the, uh, over the interval zero to zero, and that's of course going to be zero. All right, so what we say then is that sine and sine x and cosine x are orthogonal um, orthogonal with respect to uh, the inner product 0 to 2 pi f times g dx. Okay, so this is our measure of agonal. When we talk about orthogonality, we're always talking about orthogonality with respect to a particular inner product that we've chosen to be our tool to use to navigate our function space. So there's a good example then uh, of exactly this procedure. So now in the last little bit, um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give myself another sheet of paper here. I'm going to talk about now, um, now let's do, let's uh, approximate do an approximation of a function using an orthogonal set. Using an orthogonal set. So the set I'm going to use, it'll be the set of the Legendre polynomials. So the Legendre polynomials in this case are going to be, um, I can write them out. So I'm just going to write out just the first five. Um, so let's, let's write those out here. Uh, no, I'm just going to write out the first four. So I'm going to just go from n is equal to 0 to 3. And they are as such. It's going to be uh, the function 1, x, one half three x squared minus one, and uh, a last one is one half five uh, x cubed minus three x. All right. So um, in the book, they go through a good derivation of why these things are uh, are orthogonal. And okay, let's just remember we're on the function space uh, going from negative one to one. All right, so we, we've changed to this function space. It's going to be all continuous functions on the interval negative 1 to 1. All right, and now this is going to be my set. And uh, if you want, you can actually check that these are orthogonal. Okay, and you can check in the book and you actually see why they're orthogonal. But this is going to be my set, and I want to approximate uh, sine pi x. All right, this is going to be my function f of x that I want to approximate. All right, so I want to approximate, so again, the goal is to find sine pi x that's as close as I can get by taking c1, or sorry, I should, I'm going to start at 0, just to keep with the same order of polynomials here. 0 times 1 plus c1 times x, which is this function there, plus c2 times 1 half 3x squared, quantity 3x squared minus 1, plus c3 times 1 half 5x cubed minus 3x. All right. So again, the goal is to uh, find c0, c1, c2, and c3. Okay, just those four. That's all we want to find. Okay, so um, we're only going to come up with an approximation, but we know already, because these are orthogonal functions, that if I use the orthogonal projection, I can get as close as possible, I can get, I can get the minimum distance 
between this this function here and the one I want to approximate with respect to the, the the measure of length defined by the inner product right it's always with respect to that that inner product but so we can do that so um, let's write down uh, C0 we can write that down simple enough that's going to be the integral that'll be the inner product of sine pi x comma 1 over the inner product of 1 comma 1 all right and that's going to be the integral negative 1 to 1 of sine uh, pi x dx and the integral of 1 times 1 uh, well that's just going to be 1 all right so uh, remember that sine from uh, from 1 from negative 1 to 1 looks like this it's an odd function right so that's at 0 so half the function is above 0 and the other half is below 0 and they balance out perfectly and so when we integrate over that this is going to be 0 so that makes it really nice the, so c0 is 0 that's easy so c1 a little harder to do um, so that's going to be sine pi x comma x all over the inner product x comma x all right so um, uh, I'll leave out some of the details here but the bottom is just two-thirds and the top we have to use we're gonna do our integral negative one to one of x sine pi x dx and we're going to have to use uh, integration by parts, which will be negative x cosine pi x all over pi, evaluated at negative 1 to 1, plus sine pi x over pi dx. Of course, this goes to 0, and that's still 2 thirds below there. And this right here. Um, that becomes uh, 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 that becomes just this is just two over pi, right there. So uh, the result then is going to be uh, that the twos cancel, and we get a, a three over pi. Okay, so that's nice. So that's C two. Now, uh, so that was C one. Now C two, this is going to be. Uh, Again, note that C2, that's associated with this function, and this is also an even function. And again, as I said, sine is an odd function over a symmetric interval, or an interval that has uh, half of its uh, equal halves or above and below zero. Uh, in which case, we know that the integral of the product of the two will be an odd function. So we, we can automatically assume that, that C2 is zero. And finally, C3. So this one gets a little rough. Um, I don't really want to, uh, you know, I just, I'll just put it this way. We'll call this, uh, you know, P3 of X. That's what we'll call this right here. That's P3 of X. Comma sine pi of X over P3, the integral or the, the, the inner product P3 with P3. Um, and I'll just leave this one for maple because I, I really don't want to uh, have to uh, go overboard with this calculation. Uh, but maple can do it in about a half a second, and it's just 7 pi squared minus 15 all over pi cubed. All right, so that's nice. All right, so those are our three numbers. We, again, we had uh, two of them were 0. So really only two terms were included. So we're saying then that sine uh, pi x is approximately equal to uh, 3 over pi times 1 half. Oh, sorry. Apologies there. 3 over pi times x plus this term right here which I'll just call C3 times 1 half 5x cubed minus 3x. Okay, 
So just to get an idea of, of, of how good that is, why don't we just uh, upload, oh, I'll find it on there. Yeah, so there's the function right there, if you can see it. So um, the, the red line represents the sign, and the blue line represents our approximation to it by using our inner product to calculate those orthogonal projections. So with, with that now we see that the inner product is a tool that works for both function spaces and it works for uh, 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 vectors in Rn. Um, and it's this very general thing that it, it allows us to, uh, uh, to uh, calculate this notion of length and this notion of angle in, 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 in vector spaces. So thanks very much.